webinar series, webinar focus on restaurant trainings and FAIR's plan legislative and advocacy efforts around restaurants. We are fortunate enough to have two great speakers with us today. Uh, speaking first with David Crownover, product manager for ServeSafe. Uh, he's responsible for managing the ServeSafe food safety product line, including ServeSafe Manager, ServeSafe Co Course Book, ServeSafe Food Handler, and ServeSafe Allergens. Management of those products includes understanding current regulatory and industry needs. Uh, relating to training and food safety in the food service industry, Mr. Crownover has been with the National Restaurant Association for over two years. Prior to joining the National Restaurant Association, Mr. Crownover was with uh, Silica Incorporated for almost 17 years. While there, he served in many departments in the company in operations, quality control, marketing, client service, and lastly, manager of education and consulting services. Our second speaker will be George Dahlman. George serves as Vice President of Advocacy and Government Relations for Food Allergy Research and Education, where he's responsible for composing and directing the public policy agenda and building a nationwide grassroots advocacy network. George has worked in public affairs for more than 30 years on Capitol Hill and aerospace, public transportation, and healthcare. From 2000 to 2012, he was Senior Vice President of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, where George was responsible for building the public policy program for the nation's second largest cancer nonprofit. As you listen to the presenters today, Feel free to send us a question uh, in the question box at the bottom or the chat box at the bottom. Uh, we will be um, we'll be uh, uh, taking questions from there, uh, and I'll answer the ones I can. If not, we'll save some time at the end uh, to get started. But otherwise, I'm going to turn this over uh, to David. Thank you, Mike. There we go. Um, Mike invited me actually to talk. Two things. One is the reason we developed the Surf Safe Food Allergens Online course. And secondly, to just give you a little bit of an insight of what the course looks like. So to really jump in, obviously you know this. The average food allergies family concerns are, you know, they dine at restaurants that can accommodate a family member with, with food allergy. You know, they have the veto power. This is something that's not a surprise to you guys. You know this. But this is the, the discussion and the, the comments that I'm making when I'm making these kind of presentations to the restaurant industry. <laughs> Based on the number of individuals with food allergies as well as you know, the, the number of restaurants that are out there and how many people actually go out to eat on a regular basis, we decided to start querying the restaurant industry and ask them some questions about their food allergy awareness. So in the summer of 20 12, we actually did a survey with 225 food service operators. Now, these food service operators were below the top 400. They weren't the big boys. These were the small ones. These were the local owner operators, the mom and pop shops, even some small local and regional chains. And this is a phone survey. And, and on this survey, the people tell me that normally when they do these surveys on the phone, they're lucky to keep people on the phone for up to 15 minutes. Uh, interestingly enough, they couldn't get some of these folks off of the phone after 17 to 18 minutes. So there's, there's clearly a, a, an awareness and a passion by a lot of these uh, restaurant owners and food service operators to uh, talk about this very important subject. So I'm going to go through some of the results of this survey, and it'll kind of give you an idea of why the, the, the Restaurant Association decided that this was a necessary step to make. So you can see here on the, the uh, the slide, just their knowledge of the big eight. And obviously, peanuts is the biggest one. And then there's some drop off. So you can see on the, on the right hand side, of the, the, the tree nuts is fairly low. So, you know, just under two thirds understands that tree nuts are, are an allergy. So there's still a, an awareness issue that, that needs to, to, to occur. We then asked kind of a follow up which of the following food allergens are important to food service in general? and then to you and your operation. And you'll see in a couple of slides later something else that will really reinforce that there's a disconnect between what is important to food service in general. So for instance, you can see there on the left-hand side, 84% uh, say that peanuts are important to food service in general, but only 34% say that it's important to theirs. Well, that may be true. Not every restaurant is going to have peanuts or you know, some kind of peanut derivative within their products in the restaurant. But what becomes surprising is that, you know, only 22% have eggs or maybe only 41% have dairy. I find that pretty hard to, to imagine. Unless all they're serving is water and some lettuce on the side, uh, 
they're, they're going to have at least one of these. And these are just the big eight. As you well know, there's many more. So some of the really top line numbers to take away from this. 87% of those 225 said that food allergy training is an extremely important topic. Now that's, a, that's encouraging. 87%. No, yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't seen too many surveys done, whether on the phone or over the Internet, that have that high of a number that, you know, talking about this specific topic in, in general that say, you know, yeah, it's important. 78% said that they've seen an increased attention in the past two years from the industry. And that increased in attention can be anything from legislation to uh, you know, media, news stories, and just general knowledge and understanding of the, of the, the issue. And that was, two year, that was a year ago, a year and a half ago. And 85% of them said that they expect to see a, a continued increase in attention over the next two years. So they recognize that it's an issue. They recognize that it's not going anywhere and that it's here to stay. But what's worrisome is that disconnect. Do you or your organization currently train staff on food allergens? 43% said no. So 85% said that, or sorry, 87% said that they see it as extremely important, but 43% don't do it. So we kind of did a follow-up, and you can see on the bottom, and you may or may not be able to see well, depending on, on the resolution on your screen, but we asked, you know, why don't you? And these were open-ended responses. And, you know, the first, I cover the basics, don't think additional training is needed. Okay, well, you know, that may or may not be, but, you know, that's their, that's what they think. The next one, no reason, never really thought about it. Okay, so maybe that 24% of the 43% are the remnants of the ones that don't see it as important. They don't have any training programs or information to use. So that's 23% right there. That's almost a quarter of the individuals that want to do something, but they just don't know where to get it. And then finally, the, the three on the right, and the, the ones that concern me the most is, they don't serve allergen foods. It's not applicable to them, okay? They don't have the budget for it or it costs too much, and then they don't have time for the additional training. The one that really worries me the most is the first one. They don't serve allergen foods, and it's not applicable to them. Well, as you all know, and we all know, there's a, what, between 160 and 170 different food items that elicit an allergic reaction. So they're serving water, and that's all they're serving. It must be a really interesting business model. So there's that disconnect. But we did talk, we asked those who are doing it, you know, what are they using? So those that actually said they're doing training, 54% said they're, they created their cells. Or third, the, the remaining 30% said, no, we, we get it from an outside organization, which is great. And then there's the informal training materials. You know, they get some from the health department. They get some from Internet and online resources. And we all know that you can believe every single thing you read on the Internet. Some do it based on word of mouth or their own experience base, which is very powerful, actually, you know, to be able to communicate and, and uh, deliver important information like this just based on your own experience. And then last but not least, news stories. And, you know, again, this happened about a year and a half ago. It would be interesting to see if that news stories has increased just because of the amount of coverage that allergens and, unfortunately, some of the allergen deaths that have occurred recently are getting. And this is one of the last things that we asked is, you know, how do you let your customers know about any, any allergens in your operations? Well, 76%, so a full three quarters, their staff tells customers when they're asked. Now, whether they're telling them <coughs> appropriately or not is another story, but at least they're, they're telling them. It's noted on a menu, it's posted in the restaurant where people can see, and then there's another method. And then, of course, there's that wonderful 1% down on the very far right-hand side, again, where they don't offer any foods with allergens. Ultimately, all this set told us is that there is a, there's a disconnect. There's clearly more awareness that needs to occur. There's more education that needs to occur. But then there's just that general disconnect between individuals that recognize it as an important topic and then actually taking action on that importance and doing something about it. And doing something about it is the training. 
So the National Restaurant Association's mission is we exist to help our members, the cornerstone of their communities, build customer loyalty, rewarding careers, and fi financial success. And what I'm going to talk about is how we believe that this program can help with two of those three, specifically the customer loyalty and the financial success. Well, what are their restaurant challenges? Well, there's a lack of awareness and understanding in and out of the industry. There's all kinds of myths about the food, about food allergies. Um, you know, there's articles that you see every once in a while, interviews with chefs, and the chefs say, oh, they're just picky eaters. Or, you know, some of the older crowd, you know, that, that have been in the industry a long time and don't understand allergens quite as well may think of them as just picky eaters and don't recognize it, that it's a true food safety issue for these individuals. It is a matter of life and death. What's the other challenge? Well, if you're a full service, high quality, you know, fine dining establishment, your menu can change quite often, sometimes daily. Maybe at lunch you're serving a salmon as part of the special. But at dinner you're serving a, you know, a breaded chicken. Well, both of those offer all kinds of allergic issues for individuals coming in, whether they're allergic to fish or if they're allergic to dairy. So that change, those changes, sometimes on a daily basis, creates quite the challenge for really the frontline staff. And then preparation real estate is, is it a premium in restaurants? I've used this as an example. This is a, you know, just a general schematic of a manufacturing facility. And, you know, in a manufacturing facility, when you're actually processing the same thing day in, day out, you can actually segregate and specifically separate a line for products that are allergen free. But if you think about a restaurant, they're lucky if they've got 200 square feet in their preparation kitchen and more, and more often than not, they're lucky to have more than six to eight linear feet of preparation space. So it's just at an absolute premium and it's very difficult to keep in mind how to separate and segregate products based on, you know, individuals that might have an allergy to those. But then the market has potential. These three bullet points, you can see the number of children, we all know this, with food allergies increased from 50, you know, increased 50% 50 from 2000 to 2010. It's a big jump. That's a huge jump. And this next one is the one I enjoy telling individuals from, from the industry. The global market, so this is across the entire world, for food developed for those with food allergies and intolerances is expected to grow more than $26.5 billion over the next five years. That's the growth potential. That's not the total market. That's the actual potential of growth. That's a heck of a lot of money. And that's when you, you get owners, bean counters, you get them all. That's, that's when their ears start to perk up. And then you combo that with, with Paul's, some of Paul's stuff. You can see Paul Antico in an in a interview he gave back in May of 2011. There are estimates that it can increase not only the revenue, but also the profit from 10 to 25 percent. So it's one thing to increase revenue, but if you're having to do a heck of a lot of stuff behind the scenes to, to accommodate those with an increased revenue, you may lose some profit. But there's actually a lot of evidence that it may help move a lot more of that revenue down to the bottom line. And then I gotta be honest with you, I stole these numbers from John Lair. So it, you know if they're wrong, they're his fault. Just kidding. <laughs> um, let's do some real quick math. Fifteen million people with food allergies. Let's give a conservative estimate of twenty percent require a reasonable accommodation. Reasonable being let's say they only have a single food allergy. And that food allergy is relatively easy to manage. Not, not that their reaction to it is, is reasonable, but that from a restaurant perspective, it's easy for them to manage, whether it's peanuts or eggs or dairy. It's something that they can manage. And given you know, the average, fam average family size of three, and maybe for that restaurant, it's a $50 average check. There's a potential revenue loss weekly of $45 million, just adding that up. But not everybody goes out every week. But every kid has a birthday, and every kid wants to celebrate that birthday, and they want to celebrate it with their friends. So let's make it even more conservative. 
10% require a reasonable accommodation. Let's say that it's just peanuts, something simple. And it's 10, those are the family, those are the friends, those are the few adults to help corral the kids. They go to that party and ballpark 150 bucks on the average spend for it. That's with the pizza, the drinks, maybe some tickets for Chuck E. Cheese, that kind of thing. $900 million in potential lost revenue each year for not catering to these individuals. Almost a billion dollars in lost revenue. So these are the, this is the communication we've been having, I've been having actually quite a bit, and so has my boss, uh, when we present at various associations and conferences across the country. This is the kind of thing that, you know, we've been communicating. So it's not just the right thing to do, which is what we believe, but it's not just the right thing to do for the, the customer. It's the right thing to do for your business. And in doing so, we came in a partnership about a year ago with the Food Allergy Research and Education Group. And again, thanks for, for having me today. And together we created the Surf Safe Allergens online course. And this is kind of the, the marketing communication we have on our website. It's to make restaurant dining safer for the 15 million Americans coping with food allergies. You know, together we're providing restaurant personnel with evidence-based education, training, and resources. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to show you just a few quick slides of what this looks like. You can see on the kind of the splash screen, this is the very first screen you would see when you hopped into the course. It's co-branded. We recognized that FAIR was the leading name in food allergy education. At the time, actually, when we started talking to them, they were a fan, but quite a bit has happened since then. And, uh, you know, this, this actually has given, it was a wonderful launching point for both of us uh, to, to really move forward on it. So what's in the course? Well, the course really is kind of three general areas. Understanding food allergies, front of the house operations, and back of the house operations. And this is very high level information. It's really just setting that baseline of knowledge for the student. You know, defining what are food allergies, recognizing the symptoms, identifying allergies. And Pardon me. When we when we define the food allergies, it's you know what is an allergy, what is a sensitivity, and what is an intolerance. You know, going to that level. Discussing the dangers of cross contact. You know, the, the proper cleaning method. You know, in the back or in the front of the house operations, proper communication, and it's not just communication from the server or the individual taking the order and the customer, but it's also that server's communication into the back of the house and then reversing that, that communication line because that's critical. You know, workstations and self-serve areas, you know, dealing with emergencies. I, I learned so much at, at when, it, when we were building this course, um, you know, the communicating to the restaurants how to deal with a situation. Somebody might have an allergic reaction. And that's one of the things we talk about is nothing is 100%. When humans are involved, a mistake is going to be made. You know, it's no different than our food safety training that we have for microbiology or chemistry. If something happens, it's going to happen. But how do you respond to that? You know, so we also talk about not just responding and dialing 911, but also some of the customer service aspects behind it. You'd be shocked at how many times we hear of somebody saying that they still got the bill after they got a, a, an allergic reaction at a restaurant. So we tell them, comp, comp the meal, just, just as a, a, a good show of good faith but also to follow up on the tail end. Call a day or two later, find out how they're doing. Just to say, you know, we understand we made a mistake and maybe if you, at that time you found out how it happened and why it happened, communicate what happened and how you're going to correct it so it doesn't happen again in the future. It goes a long way to fostering that relationship to make certain that it is a partnership between restaurants and the individuals that are coming in. And then and finally, the importance of when you're receiving those food deliveries, understanding what the label, uh, the preparation, and then the cleaning and personal hygiene. So these are just some of the high-level stuff that you'll see and you'll hear about. So what have we done in the course? Um, we've taken a huge step and a break in how we normally do online training. Traditionally, when you see a lot of online training courses, they are 
basically a PowerPoint on steroids with a disembodied voice walking you through and reading every bullet point you see on the screen. And frankly, that's pretty boring. Not, um, you know, food safety is the most sexiest of topics, but we at least try and make it as engaging as possible. So what we've done with this course is we use an avatar to lead the students through the course. And you can see the avatar here. Her name is Sylvie. And Sylvie's a trainer uh, within Grandma Sally's restaurant. And that's where you can see some of these settings. And the course then, you navigate from one room to another instead of a clicking a, a, a next button. So you can see in that slide, in that screen on the left-hand side, the door is kind of uh, illuminated. It's, it's highlighted in blue. Well, in the course, you actually click on that door and you navigate. You specifically move to this next room on the right. So it, it keeps the engagement of the student. It keeps them, you know, keeps their eye on the ball, for, for instance. And they're not, you know, kind of glassing over and, and lose focus. We also have various activities that are introduced to facilitate, uh, you know, retention of the information that's provided. So within the course, as they're going through, they're provided a bit of information, you know, a, a, a chunk of information that may take a couple of minutes to hear and learn. And then they go in and they do an activity to reinforce that bit of information that they've learned. And that's how the whole course is designed. Of information, activity to reinforce. Another chunk of information, activity to reinforce. So we've got at least two of the different activities that we perform here. The first one on the left-hand side is kind of a multiple choice. You know, which menu item should a guest with a peanut allergy avoid? Well, the easiest one on that one, down to the bottom, is a peanut butter sandwich. Another type of activity, as you see on the right-hand side, is called a drag and drop. What that means is you see those white boxes with a question above it, those highlighted or hyperlinked text underneath, you drag and drop into the most appropriate response. We also have true and false, um, put in sequential order, I believe we also have a fill in the blank. So there's a wide variety of different activities. So again, they're not kind of zoning out on it. And finally, a chance to celebrate completion of the course before taking the exam. Exam to uh, uh, take at the end of this. The whole course start to finish lasts about an hour, hour and a half, and that's with the exam included. The exam itself is about 30 questions, and I believe it's a 75% pass rate. And you can see there on the right hand side, those celebrating are Grandma Sally, her goat, and that little guy that you see on the left hand side standing on top of the television, he's one of the other. <coughs> individuals, the other avatars that you interact with in the course. His name is Dr. H. Uh, H is short for histamine. Dr. H actually is our, our scientific guru, and he really helps communicate a lot of the scientific and, and technical information that you learn within it. So not just the, the uh, specifics on policies and procedures, but you know the, 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 the real nitty-gritty behind the whys. You know, maybe on the uh, symptoms of an allergic reaction giving some infographics behind it. And so finally, uh, I'm just going to leave you with what our website is for this course and kind of tagline that we're using, 15 million reasons to be allergen trained. This is what we're using on that website to, for our restaurants to when they come to. So it, it's that communication. So it's not just the single individual. It's 15 million reasons across the United States why you really want to raise the allergen awareness within your restaurant and ultimately improve the, the relations between your customers and yourself. I'm going to steal quickly in closing uh, a, a line that I heard from Ted Allen, who is the uh, host of the TV network show Chops. I was fortunate enough to be at the Chicago luncheon back in, uh, I believe it was May, this past year, and he was speaking, and he, great, he, he brought a really good point. And this is one of the, the points that I, I talk about and I use in closing when uh, talking to the restaurant industry. Dining, eating, is one of the last rituals that we as humans have, and it's one of the last social rituals that we have. We ritually eat usually three times a day, sometimes two, sometimes four, five, or six, depending on your eating habits. But in general, it is a very social ritual. 
And individuals with food allergies are denied inclusion into that social ritual. And the way I close is that, you know, think of the power you would have to be able to re-include those excluded individuals into a safe haven, into someplace comfortable so that they can be social again with their family, they can be social again with their friends, with their colleagues, and so that they feel safe and they knowing that by eating at your restaurant, they can, they can feel comfortable doing so. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to George and uh, let him do his thing, and then we'll take some questions at the end. Thank you, David. And thank you for all of you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to um, just thank David for, for providing this, but I, I mentioned that this is really um, the way FAIR is approaching this is, is, is that this has actually been um, kind of stars all being aligned in a kind of a, a, of a situation um, that has enabled us to move pretty aggressively, I think, in, in a campaign now to try to help um, the restaurant industry accommodate people and accommodate the kind of program that David's outlined that, that the NRA has put together. So we're looking at FAIR at launching um, um, some campaigns, and, and some of it is based on things that have already transpired. And I wanted to, to outline some of those for you so you can see where we're heading. Um, as most people in the community know, um, the Massachusetts experience, uh, uh, which is uh, resulted from a law passed in 2009, um, provides kind of a basis of, of, of good practice as it stands right now for restaurants um, across the country. And that, that law that was passed prov provides a couple, of, a couple of key features um, that are kind of the groundwork for, for uh, this campaign. Um, it, it requires a poster in the work area for, uh, for staff that covers allergens. Um, and alerting to them to that. Um, it requires a display on, on menus or menu boards that says, in essence, before placing your order, please let your, your server know that you have a food allergy. And at least one certified food protection manager has to have completed a food allergen awareness uh, course and get a training certificate. In Massachusetts, that has been a rather um, um, loose um, requirement. There is a video requirement there now. Um, the, the program that David's just outlined actually takes that uh, uh, quite a few steps further. It, it, it's, um, it makes sure that people are, uh, the staff are pretty sufficiently tested on, on what the, their knowledge should be in food allergies. Um, since the Massachusetts law passed, we've also seen Rhode Island do it. Um, and David has just uh, mentioned to me earlier that uh, Rhode Island has now allowed for, as a, as a, um, certificate of approval of this training program that, uh, that the NRA has just launched with us. Um, but there have been some other things, too, that, as I say, the stars have kind of aligned to be a perfect opportunity for us to be pursuing a, a legislative campaign. One is earlier, mid-last year, there was the, um, the presentation of the Discovery Channel, um, which outlined the experience um, and the campaigns that went on um, by advocates. Uh, in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. I have to tell you, we were absolutely flooded with people who said, I want to do that in my state. Um, and we've had a whole raft of people who have, you know, great, great opportunities uh, and great willingness to kind of lead campaigns. And so we definitely want to take advantage of that. And, and so that's what we're building our campaign on. Um, there's obviously the program, uh, the other part of it is that the NRA has actually, you know, they've done this program, so we have a tool to really base it off of. And really, the community um, has been so involved with, with this issue in, over the past year um, that it's, it's, um, it's, it's a valuable opportunity for us to, to build off of. Um, there was, in fact, that, that experience um, really generated another opportunity, uh, another kind of case study. Um, a volunteer in Maryland had went, went to Massachusetts and was so elated about their experience there that came and came back to Maryland and went to the legislature and passed, got a piece of legislation drafted, introduced. Um, the legislation eventually, it was, it was intended to mirror Massachusetts. It was, it was uh, watered down a bit. Um, they did concede that there would be a poster displayed in 
um, the food service areas, but they also created a task force um, in which she was on, um, I as Representative Fair and another uh, advocate were on, along with the National Restaurant Association, um, to basically look at a number of features of, of how restaurants deal with food allergies and food safety. Um, it covered obviously more than just food allergies, but for those pieces that were included, um, it wanted to figure out a baseline. What, what is the food allergy awareness training currently done in the state? Um, what issues are related to it? What are the existing uh, materials that are available for training on food allergies? Um, what's done in other states? And what are, importantly, what are the legal issues uh, related to food allergens in the training and compliance with ADA and other kinds of, of, of liability issues? So those were all examined in the course of this, and I, I have to say I think that we learned quite a bit about what to expect in future campaigns, some of the questions that will be asked by legislators, some of the issues that advocates will be asked, and some of the, some of the provisions and how they're addressed by the health community and by health regulators in the states. So the final recommendations that they came out with, and I think um, uh, it is something, again, something that we can build off of, again, beyond what's already been done in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, the task force is recommending that with legislation that will be introduced um, in the next month or so, that there be a food service facilities have a display on their menus um, that ask people to notify their servers if they have an allergy, um, that they have at all times on their premises, that was a key feature, a member of the staff who has taken an allergen awareness training course and pass an accredited test. These are key distinctions um, that we're, we wanted to make sure were in there. Um, and of course, in this case, the department will figure out when it's uh, when it's uh, implemented. Um, they will also have on their website um, training courses that are available, uh, and they'll list resources for that so that restaurants know where to go. Um, and the department will initiate tracking. Uh, this was a key feature that was asked of by one of the advocates on the task force um, to track when there are notifications of food allergy reactions so that um, the Department of Health and the state can keep track of that. So with some of that experience behind us, we're now looking to do um, a, a series of campaigns uh, based on those kind of elements and uh, experience. Uh, so we are kind of figuratively setting the table. Uh, we've pulled together a group of advocate experts, policy experts from the field, really people who are um, just very interested in this, have, have some experience uh, and knowledge and uh, have some background with, uh, with their state, um, and getting their advice on how to pursue this. I think, as I said, after the Discovery Channel um, piece came out, we were inundated with people who wanted to do this. So we're really encouraged that there are a number of key states where we have opportunities. We've put together a model bill. I'll go over some, some of the features of that. Um, we're de developing and, and have already some supporting documentation. When, when advocates are in their state capitals or working on this, they're going to need some substantial um, backing support, uh, Q&A pieces, letters to the editor, um, testimonials, um, things like that. And we want to be able to provide those as much as possible so that they, um, they are completely armed when they do this. And provide also. Um, them with the lists or contacts within the state. We at FAIR uh, collect all sorts of, of databases of people who are interested in working on particular issues, and I think for those leaders in the states who are involved with this, they're going to need to know who those people are uh, so they can rally them to the cause. So some of the provisions um, that we're looking for in our model bill is, of course, some of the elements you've seen already, that the menu boards um, require people to alert uh, or ask people to alert their server on their allergies, um, have available at all times a member of the staff who has taken the approved allergen training course. Um, and this was another feature that came up in the Maryland piece too, is make sure that allergen awareness training of their staff uh, and, and part of their standard operating procedures. It's, it's, and this is actually very key. Um, it's one thing to ask uh, that a manager or someone on staff be there who has had food allergy training. It's absolutely critical, uh, probably just as important if not more so, that the standard operating procedures of the restaurant require that if a person notifies a server uh, that they have an allergy, that that server knows that the procedure being, you go and talk to the manager and find out exactly what's required 
uh, to accommodate this customer. So that's another feature that we're going to try to put in, in the model bill. Um, also that they have, a, a, again, a poster that's displayed in the food handling area that the State Department of Health uh, track and report on al allergic reactions, both to the restaurant, for the restaurant, and that patrons can also register their, um, their experiences. And also, uh, this was a feature that was not, um, it was not, has not been enacted in Massachusetts, although it was in the statute, or in the, in the statute, that the state, uh, the Department of Public Health designate uh, participating restaurants as food allergy friendly and maintain a list of those. There have been some difficulties in trying to implement that because of um, changes in menus and changes in experiences. But that is something that we also try to, uh, to have accommodated in the model bill. One of the tools that we're going to have available to grassroots, to advocates, the grass tops advocates, if you will, uh, the leaders in the state, but also from our point of view, is to be able to take um, our growing database of advocates around the country uh, and be able to equip grass tops leaders uh, with the, the, um, that list um, and be able to put out alerts to people when there's legislation that is, is up before uh, in their state, state capital. Um, whether that's in the committee or whether that's down the road when it's on the floor. All of the database is broken down by state legislative district as well as on federal legislative districts. So we're able to target officials and, um, and able to help uh, grass tops leaders organize the different teams that need to address an issue. So uh, finally, I just wanted to mention we, um, we have a number of states that we're looking at right now to do this in. I think we're casting a wide net. Uh, some of these may work out, they may not work out. Uh, the, each state has its own different uh, flavor and approach to how they do this. Um, but certainly these are states where we have heard from advocates uh, very loudly that they want to do this, and so we're taking them up on their offer. Um, California, obviously, is a, is a huge one. I think um, the NRA tells us that they are um, uh, probably uh, very accommodating to this because of requirements that are already in existence. Um, Illinois, uh, that may be, as I say, each of these is different, may be a different approach for us more, more administratively. Um, Michigan, um, they have, uh, we have some strong advocates in Lansing and um, they are very interested in pursuing this and there has already been a, a accommodation by the Michigan Restaurant Association that, that should make this easier. Um, New York, um, we have a, a core group of people that are very strong, uh, very prominent, and I think uh, some champions in the legislature there uh, who already have, have looked at a restaurant bill in the past, and I think uh, it's, it's a good environment for us. Uh, and the other is New Jersey. Maryland, obviously, we're going to have um, a bill introduced as, as a result of this task force, so we'll be um, working on that. And North Carolina and Florida are both places where we have people who are very active and who are very interested in, in pursuing this. So. Um, I guess I would uh, conclude by saying if, if there's anybody out there um, who wants to work on this issue in their state, um, these are some that we are proactively looking at right now, but certainly if someone wants to lead a campaign otherwise in, a, in, in any other state uh, or join in any of these, uh, we're happy to have you and enthusiastic about it. Um, we, can, uh, we can offer um, uh, a lot of support, including all that collateral material that I mentioned as well as um, kind of aerial support in the electronic communications. So I think with that, I just wanted to provide an outline of what we're launching at this point. Um, and I'm happy to answer the questions, and I, as I know David is too, about both the, um, the training program and this is the core, and the training program at the core of what this campaign is all about. Um, so I guess I'll open it up, Mike, if you have any. Sure, we do. We've gotten a few questions in, and feel free to continue to send us in through the questions, uh, via the questions box uh, on your task bar there. Uh, one question, I guess there's probably more for David, and I can try to assist as well if you'd like, but um, you'd mentioned about the how um, critical space is in the back of a restaurant uh, and how small uh, the area is. So for smaller restaurants that are trying to do this, for someone that has family that's going to a restaurant that may go to a small restaurant, I mean, would you recommend them? Should they steer clear of those? Um, should they, uh, you know, only go to large restaurants? Is it possible for a small restaurant to accommodate? It's a great question. And actually, I'm going to turn that around and say it's really ultimately up to the restaurant to be able to determine whether they can accommodate or not based on what the allergy is. That's the other thing, and I probably didn't 
communicate that well in my presentation, but one of the things that, I, that uh, when I'm presenting to the restaurant industry is, you know, accommodation really is a voluntary aspect. And it's up to the restaurant to determine whether they can accommodate for a specific allergy or not. Um, obviously, you know, Lone Star Steakhouse is not going to be able to accommodate for somebody with a peanut allergy because there's peanuts all over the floor. Then again, an individual with a peanut allergy probably is not going to go to Lone Star. But they can probably accommodate for, uh, you know, somebody with a shellfish allergy or a fish allergy. And it really does depend, and it's up to the restaurant to be able to determine and understand whether they can accommodate or not. And that's also what the program is, is really designed for, is to help them start making those decisions, start making those, you know, conceptually, what can they do? You know, they may not be able to accommodate for all eight of the big eight, but I'm certain there's some that they can accommodate for. And, you know, one of the things that we've had conversations with FAIR is that, you know, customers that are going to restaurants would rather know up front whether they can be accommodated for or not, not on the tail end after something bad has already happened. A uh, question that just came in that's probably for either one of you, and I've seen you allude to this in some slides before, David, so you probably take this one, but what are some of the legal ramifications? Leslie, thank you. Leslie uh, University ruling, um, which is really does specifically address the ADA component, is very specific to universities. There was at one point a Wall Street Journal article that came out that claimed that the implications then were that every restaurant was going to have to accommodate for every allergy, and uh, the Department of Justice quickly came out and said, no, that's not the case. As it relates to restaurants, individuals have a choice of going where they please to get food, whereas an individual on a university or college campus that is really confined and limited to their choices, and especially as it relates to their agreements to you know, the, the purchasing of those products on that campus, they're confined. That's where that came from. The ADA is an interesting kind of, not necessarily slippery slope, but it's a, it's and interesting as it, as it relates to it. If you think about it from a diabetes perspective, not every restaurant has to accommodate for somebody with diabetes because there are options. Um, so from that standpoint, I don't really see it affecting the restaurants as much. Um, limited service areas like universities, like colleges, like schools, you know, elementary, high school, those kind of things. That's a whole different ball of wax because they are limited in their options of what they can eat. What do you think, George? Yeah, I was, well, was going to say, uh, the, the, during the course of the task force that we had in Maryland, um, that was one of the questions was liability issues for restaurants and, and generally as far as food allergies was concerned. And I, I, I guess I have to put this carefully. The Attorney General for the state came out with a statement, uh, issued a letter, and it wasn't really a determination, but it was an observation that there really is very little case law uh, associated with people having allergic reactions in restaurants. And they mentioned that you could argue quite the opposite, that because there are training programs on food allergies, that restaurants might actually be more liable if they didn't take advantage of that and they were less aware of it. So um, I guess in a, in a sense the jury's still out, but I think that the increasing sensitivity and the availability of resources really – makes it more compelling for restaurants to actually go through the training. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, uh, um, and that's some of the conversations I've had with even customers where I've sat down and talked to them. They, they ask, you know, well, if I take this, doesn't that make me more, more liable? And I turn it back around and say, actually, yeah. it's probably right. the opposite. Um, if you have, if you are aware that, you know, going back to the survey that I, that I showed, 87% say they recognize that right. food allergy training is important. But they are one of the 43% that said, yeah, but uh, I, I either don't have the money, it's not important to me, you know, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And then somebody has a reaction because of the lack of awareness of everybody else in the restaurant. Yeah, they probably could be held liable. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a risk I don't think restaurants are, are, should want to take. Yeah. Can you talk uh, any other languages that ServeSafe is offered in? Uh, yeah, right now it's in English. 
Uh, it will be in Spanish very, very soon. Um, we had a few hiccups with that. Um, at this point, it's just English and Spanish. We are evaluating other languages for uh, depending on the market. Um, if you look at census populations outside of Spanish, the next most common language is Chinese, specifically Mandarin. Um, and then from there, you start jumping down into uh, Korean, Vietnamese, Tagalog, uh, which is Indonesian. Uh, trying to, Vietnamese, I think, are really kind of the top five. That being said, those top five, all five of them combined make up less than 4% of the population. So, you know, we obviously have to evaluate um, kind of a cost, you know, a return on investment aspect of it. That being said, we're looking at trying to make some relationships with uh, like the Asian Alliance and other associations that can help us kind of reduce some of those costs so that we can roll it out. Um, we know for a fact that Chinese restaurants are some of the worst when it comes to violating cross-contact and allergen and hidden allergens in some of the products. So, you know, that's it's also a high risk area, so we're actively keeping an eye on that. But at this point in time, it's English and, and very soon to be Spanish. Great. There's a question which I can answer. There's a question about uh, for these restaurants that are taking this course, how can they be found? We are building, Affairs building a database in the background um, that will be available probably late March, early April. Uh, so you'll be able to search in your local area by your address or cuisine whatever, and see uh, how many people have taken the course in that restaurant, uh, the percentage of staff, and there'll be a space there for restaurants to talk about whatever their allergen procedures are, so you can really be informed uh, in going there. There was a question, uh, and if you can expand, what aspects of label reading uh, is included in the course, David? Specifically, the, we, we do touch on uh, the FALCPA, the Food Allergy Labeling Consumer Protection Act. Um, the Label reading really is designed around talking about what that is, but it's for the restaurant to understand their incoming ingredients. It does touch a little bit on how they should be labeling their products that are being sold, not for consumption on site, but almost as a retail aspect of it. But our focus really more is on, on training them on what to look for on incoming ingredients talking about a no substitution policy, talking about how things can accidentally be changed by a supplier. Um, for all, in, you know, with the best intentions in mind, uh, you know, something runs out, so they replace it with something else, and that something else happens to have a, an allergen in it versus you know, the, the one previously didn't. So that's really where it boils down to. It's, it's helping the employees, managers, who are receiving the products to understand how to look at those products, how to look at the bill of lading or the invoice when it comes in and understanding, you know, to match it up and say, uh, you know what, this isn't what I ordered. And then when they look at that thing that they didn't order, you know, that was maybe substituted for them, to have a critical eye to look at that ingredient so that it's also not a surprise for the chef or for anybody else when they're making it and ultimately for the, the consumer when they're in the restaurant. So uh, you said you had mentioned that, that Chinese foods are one of the highest risk types of restaurants in terms of allergens and cross contaminations. Any other types of restaurants that you would might caution against? Uh, I, that I don't know. <laughs> are you, is that you're willing to put me on the spot for that one? I know, right? Uh, uh -huh. I need just from you know from some of the stuff that I've heard and some of the things that really shocked me. Uh, you know, I think they use some of them use peanuts as the binding agent for egg rolls to actually cause it to stick instead of egg which amazes me. But, you know, so I don't know of any others. Um, to be honest, I am not an allergen expert. I am a food safety expert in general, so I'm more of a generalist. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't know too many others. So, uh, we had a couple questions about where else might we kind of apply this training to. Uh, I can answer the first one. I'll, I'll throw out the second one just so you can think about it if you do have any thoughts on this. Uh, will be for... Um, for hospital um, food service staff. Uh, the other question was asked about what about college culinary staff? 
Um, we will be announcing a, a very large college initiative uh, in a press release uh, early next week. Um, the good news is there's absolutely good in this arena, uh, thanks to a grant that FAIR has received. Uh, and, and as early as next week, uh, we are bringing together a subject. But look for something early next week. Uh, regarding that, we certainly have movement there. Any thoughts on the hospital piece? You know, um, I would say that the, the, the way the course is designed does have a heavy restaurant, you know, both full service and quick service, you know, fast food kind of flair to it. That being said, the concepts behind it can be applicable really anywhere. So if somebody absolutely needs to take something right now and get some great foundation of, you know, obviously the basics of what food allergens are, food allergies are, um, and just some general concepts on controlling cross-contact, understanding the communication aspect of it. There, in my mind, there's no reason why they can't utilize this to give themselves a leg up and a good start. Um, I think it's, it's material, you know, Controlling cross-contact cross is controlling cross-contact. You know, understanding what an allergen is, it doesn't matter if you're in a hospital, in a restaurant, or in a school. Knowing that is, is a big step up, and that knowledge really is powerful. Um, you know, whether you're controlling cross-contact in the back of a kitchen at a, at a you know, three Michelin star restaurant, or, you know, mom pa's diner on the corner, or at the commissary or the back kitchen at a hospital or at a, at a university. It's just using that knowledge to be able to control it in your operation. Are there more that you could learn? Absolutely. You know, and there's a lot more that you can understand, and the specific, you know, especially the specifics as it relates to individuals in hospitals and their, and their, uh, you know, their susceptibility to further injury should they actually be in a hospital for something. Um, so, uh, you know, at this point, I think it can be applied. Is it 100% applicable? Yeah, not necessarily, but, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, the course is not 100% applicable to 100% of the restaurants in the United States. It's really just laying that foundation of knowledge. Have you thought about targeting uh, culinary schools to kind of hit the, the chefs before they even start? We have a very good relationship with Pearson, and Pearson is uh, a book supplier and is one of the largest book suppliers for the academic market. And so we have been in, in discussions with them. We've also been in discussions, and uh, I believe, and I forgot to tell you this earlier, Mike, I believe I am actually having a presentation and webinar on Friday to Johnson & Wales, who's a large culinary school. Um, so, yeah, we're, we, that is part of our um, campaign strategy is to also hit out at the – the culinary schools, whether it's the big boys at the Culinary Art Institute all the way down to just the Art Institute and uh, Johnson & Wales, and uh, I think Le Cordon Bleu is another one that, that uh, might gain a lot of uh, value out of a program like this. Great. Um, and George, you've gotten several requests from other states, one of which is just yeah. for Utah. So oh, that's great. On that. <laughs> I told them to contact you uh, as well. Good. Um, uh, you know, we have other questions. See, um, bear with me one second. There are a lot of questions that came in all at once here. Um, any recommendation? Who, can, who would you recommend to take the course? Is it really suitable for everyone, David, uh, that works in a restaurant? That's a great question. We've really designed the course to be applicable to everybody within the restaurant, um, within the food service operation. Uh, that in mind, uh, restaurants have a pretty high turnover rate. So ultimately, we think that the best individuals that, that would benefit the most out of this are individuals, from the owner, maybe the manager, uh, the chef, head chef, maybe one other chef that, that is on the premises quite often. And, and then uh, one or two of your most senior members that, that they think are going to be around for a while. You know, and they, these people can then be identified as the go-to person when somebody comes in and has a, a question about allergens. Um, that way, you know, onboarding for the first day for a brand new employee, they know, hey, you know 
want, let's say I'm the person that, that is the go-to person. Hey, if you got any questions, if, if a customer comes in and asks and says they have an allergy, go get Dave. Dave will be the one that can help it out. They can facilitate, he can facilitate the conversation.